All right, let's go. So we're going to be looking at uh, Barnabas and Stephen tonight. And what we're going to do next Sunday is we're going to cover the 13th apostle, which was Saul, um, uh, who received a new name of Paul. And so that'll be next week. And then that will conclude our very first season, if you will, of the Interrupters. And then uh, the following week after that, we have Robert Hodgkin, who will be here uh, at all three services. But on Sunday night, he's going to do something special. Uh, Robert wrote a, a, a fascinating book called uh, The Battle for the Mind, the Will, and the Emotions. And on Sunday night, okay, uh, he is going to do a special deep dive into this study of what it looks like to be an overcomer in the area of overcoming the areas of the soul that would like to define you and to step into victory. And so that's going to be, that's going to be really cool, doing a deep dive of that, of that particular book. I love, I love that book. Um, when I get back from uh, being in Europe, uh, which is interesting, that, that, that just, just being in that part of the world, uh, when I get back, um, we're going to do a, a, an intro to the second season of The Interrupters. And we're going to do an entire week on the conversion of Constantine and the moment that Christianity changed forever. Being an underground movement of radicals, outlaws, if you will, um, to becoming uh, an institutionalized national religion, okay? And uh, so we're going to spend a week on the conversion of Constantine, and then we're going to deep dive into, um, I believe it's probably going to be a, a, a couple of months as we dive into uh, the mystics, the desert fathers, and, um, and some radical supernatural missionaries who evangelized whole cities through the power of God. So that's going to be, that's going to be wild. And uh, so we have good times ahead of us. Amen? Yeah. This, has been, this has been such a journey. I, I've loved doing this. Uh, going on a, 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 this is a, the first time that I've ever done a study of this degree into the, into the disciples who followed Jesus and these great missionaries known as the apostles or the sent ones. And tonight we're going to be covering... Um, uh, Barnabas, who, who is actually known as an apostle, who is actually considered one of the sent ones. Um, and then we're going to be looking at Stephen, who is, uh, who is one of the first deacons in the church. And then I'm going to do a, an appeal for those called to be deacons, and we're going to quadruple our deacon team tonight. Amen? Or, or, or not. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what we'll do. Uh, but this, this, will be, this will be good. So, yep, tonight looking at... Um, Barnabas and uh, Stephen. I know it says uh, Philip. All right, so Barnabas. Um, Barnabas was known as the man of encouragement, yeah? And uh, most of what we know about Barnabas comes from the book of Acts, which is good because we have been studying various um, uh, apostles where not a lot is written about them and we're using pieces of, of church history to kind of put together a bit of a, of a puzzle. We don't have to do that with Barnabas. We know quite a bit about Barnabas because of the book of Acts and we know that um, uh, uh, we get to look into the, the journal of Dr. Luke and we get to look at his um, missionary uh, journeys. We get to see at the relationship that he had with, um, with Paul. And we know that uh, Acts 11.24 identifies Barnabas as a good man. Okay, so that's good. Yeah? I, I, you know, it, you, we all want to hopefully be known as a good man, if, if you're a man. Full of the Holy Spirit. And faith. So this is the theme. You're going to see a theme between these two generals that we read about tonight. Is that these were men who were known. They had a, they had a reputation for being full or possessed with the Holy Spirit. How many of you would love to have a reputation, okay, that you're not just known for being a good person, okay, that's good, but you're known for being a good person and you are actually known for being full of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, okay? Barnabas was also known, not for just being full of the Holy Spirit, but for also being a man who was full of faith. We know that Barnabas brought a great number of people to the Lord. He was an 
awesome missionary, and he loved to tell people about Jesus. His travels and his ministry are described throughout the book of Acts, and he is mentioned not just in the book of Acts, but there's mentions of Barnabas in the book of Galatians, 1 Corinthians, and Colossians. We see, for, we see his name mentioned first in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, where it describes Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Thank God. You know, all right, good. Son of encouragement. That's a good nickname. Okay. And it says that he sold a field that he had owned. Okay, so he's a landowner. Okay, and he had some money. And he brought the money. And what did he do? He laid it at the apostles' feet. He's known for his ministry of encouragement, his ministry of support, and his ministry of generosity. We know that Paul, who is still known as Saul early in his ministry, had become a fervent follower of Christ. And Barnabas took this unknown disciple underneath his wing. You see, at this point in time, most, evangel most uh, uh, evangelism occurred through people sharing their faith. With the conversion of Saul, it was different in that a person did not lead Saul into his faith. The Lord Jesus Christ himself invited Saul into this life-changing journey, which is, yep, great. That's awesome. Except nobody believed that he was actually saved. I, I had a friend that was a drummer in a pretty famous uh, Christian rock band. And when he got saved, um, he found himself in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an interesting position in that he was still drinking and he was still uh, doing drugs, but he loved Jesus, which meant that the people that he would drink with and do drugs with didn't want to be around him. <laughs> but then the Christian people, they didn't want to be around him either. Why? Because even though he said he loved Jesus, he was still drinking and doing drugs. That's a difficult place to be when your unchristian friends don't want to be around you. And... Christians don't even want to be your friends. And this is a, a, an interesting position that Saul finds himself in. Jesus Christ came to him, okay? And he had a bit of a reputation, okay? Uh, you know, he, he would need some unwise choices, like kill Christians. Anyways, you know, enough about that. You know, but so now here you have this guy that says, Hey, guys, hey, can I be a part of your church? And they're like, Aren't you the guy that was persecuting the church? Well, yeah, that was the old me, but Jesus came to me. Yeah, I bet. You're a mole. You're a spy. You're trying to penetrate our deal, and you are a bad spy. You're not even convincing. Yeah, I bet. Jesus came to you and knocked you off your thing, you know, knocked you off your mule and blind. Yeah, I, I bet. And this is where Barnabas comes in. And we see that Barnabas takes him under his wing, and he vouches for him. The, the apostles, they were afraid because of his past actions. And, um, and he says, no, this, 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 this Saul, he's legitimate. He, he's a new creation. Um, I am going to vouch for him. I, 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 am, I am going to take responsibility for him. If things go bad, hey, you can put it on me. I'm going to be the bridge for this guy so that he can come into the church, be a part of the kingdom of God, because I believe in this guy. I believe that there's a huge call of God on this guy. And I believe in times like these, we need a Barnabas company. We need people, right, that are willing to be with people that are still in transition. People that don't have it all figured out yet. The people that say, you say you're saved. Well, you don't look saved. You don't smell saved. You don't talk saved. But I believe in you. I see the call of God on on you, and yet you're a little embarrassing to be around, okay, but I'm willing to take you under my wing. I will be the bridge from the world into the family of Jesus, and that's what, that's what Barnabas was. He was the relational bridge, okay, from a very religious, pharisaical environment into the family of God. 
Later passages would detail how Barnabas uh, was doing the work of God in Antioch, but decided to find Paul so that the two could work together. So not only did he vouch for him, but the, these two guys, Paul and Barnabas, um, become uh, uh, partners in kingdom ministry. And this wasn't just kingdom ministry. This ministry was fruitful. These guys did incredible things. In fact, Paul was awesome. And Barnabas was awesome. But Paul and Barnabas together was like next level. Next level partnership and collaboration. The church grew uh, numerically in an unprecedented way through these guys. And the church prospered financially. Incredible finances began coming into the church because of Paul and Barnabas working together. Okay? Um, now, this partnership didn't last forever. Okay? They had... They had a bit of a, uh, they had a, a bit of a, 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 a little thing. There was a little bit of apostolic drama, okay? And, and, uh, and let me just say, that's not uncommon even to this day, okay? Uh, you have good people that love Jesus, but within the kingdom, sometimes there's some apostolic drama. Usually it's more prophetic drama. Usually, usually the prophets are a little, little more you know, a little drama queen thing, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, but we see that when it comes to drama in the church, that is not anything new under the sun. And don't worry, yep, they went their own ways, okay, at a certain point in time. We'll look at this in a second. And they, they resolve it. it. It is all good. But I'll tell you, I think that in, in the first century church, everybody would look back and say, oh, man, oh, man, do you remember... When Paul, do you remember that conference? <laughs> when Paul and Barnabas were together and they ministered together. Do you remember that atmosphere? Do you remember that revelation? Do you remember? Isn't that awesome? And this is a part of our, this is a part of our, so, yep, yeah, um, there's something about, there's something about what is possible when two people come together, when two churches come together, when two ministries come together, when a husband and wife come together. There's something that is possible through unity where God can't help himself. He commands a blessing. And we should always be looking for what we call, even with Renaissance Coalition, we call it apostolic resonance. We should always be looking for people that when we get around them, our spirits start going, wah, 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 wah. like we start getting energized by the relationship. I hope that if you've, if, if you've made SRC your home church, I hope it's because when you came, you felt apostolic resonance. You felt your spirit and, and, and the church, and, and church here going, wah, 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 wah. You felt that, that, that resonating in the spirit. And if you didn't, that's, that, 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 that's okay. You, you, can, you, can, you can drink here. That's all right. Yeah. But I believe that every person, we've got a nice well, and we're generous, okay? So come and, you who have no money, come and buy, okay? We're, we're here to, to feed the region, okay? You're free drinks for all, okay? It's, they're bottomless here. You can have a drink right now. Go ahead. You can have five. One, two, three, four, five. Whoa, right? Sing ding pao hey. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, but my prayer for every person in this room is that eventually you come into a company of people, whether you're meeting in a living room or maybe you're even meeting, you know, at a coffee shop or maybe you're even meeting in a big mega church. I don't know. But my prayer for every person in this room is that eventually you come into a company of people where there's apostolic resonance and you know that is your people, that is your tribe, and there within that assembly you are empowered to do what God has created you to do. And we see that these two guys actually establish an, a, an apostolic resource center. They actually establish, we'll call it a revival center, okay? And it is known as the ARC, Antioch Revival Center. At this time, there's two major revival centers. 
JRC, okay, which is the Jerusalem Revival Center, okay, and, and, and they have very uh, Jewish worship, which is fun, and they all dance, and they, they, go, they get after it, uh, yeah, you know, JRC, Jerusalem Revival Center, and then you've got the other major apostolic center, which was planted by Paul and Barnabas, which was ARC, the Antioch Revival Center. And what were these two revival centers? They were like airports. People were always coming and going, coming and going. There was lively debate and discussion regarding doctrine and regarding what was acceptable and what was unacceptable. And, um, and you got debate and doctrine and worship and prayer and a lot of eating. They would debate it together to do their thing, and then they would have maybe some fish, and then they would break bread, and they would say, this bread is the body of Christ, and we partake of this bread in remembrance of him. And then they would take the wine, and they would say, this wine is the blood of Christ. Let's drink in remembrance of our great friend, our great Savior, Jesus the Christ. And there, together with honor, Honest relationship. The apostles would gather and, and with no fear of conflict. These guys had no fear of conflict. Sometimes I wonder if some of them live for it. Guys like Peter and even guys like Paul. I mean, these guys, even guys like Barnabas, you know, these guys, they were hardcore in their beliefs. They were hardcore in their experiences and they were hardcore in their doctrine. And they believed that your beliefs would determine your trajectory. They believed that what you believed and what you declared, that, that your declaration would determine your destination. And therefore, they would hold each other accountable for their beliefs, their practices, and where they were going and how they were living. Let's look at uh, the background of Barnabas. We see that as a Levite, Barnabas was raised as a Jew and was most likely quite wealthy. Okay, uh, he was schooled in Hebrew uh, religious foundation instruction, and uh, references in the Bible indicate that he was a respected figure. In Acts fourteen twelve, Barnabas was referred to as Zeus. Okay, <laughs> which is interesting. We'll get into this in a second. While his companion Paul, who did most of the speaking, was referred to as Hermes. To the ancient Greeks, Zeus was the lead god, considered the god of the sky and thunder and the ruler of all other gods, okay? Um, so that's how they saw Barnabas. Barnabas, he is, they saw the anointing on these guys and, they, and, they, and, and, and the only grid that they had was Greek mythology. And they're looking at Barnabas and Paul and they're like, Barnabas He's the man. He's the leader. Barnabas has got more stuff going on than Paul. Barnabas is Zeus, okay? Uh, which, is, which is fascinating. Um, Barnabas was born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi and was probably educated as a Pharisee in the school of, uh, good times, in the school of, this isn't now hard, get you. What? Thanks. Gamaliel. Is that good? I was looking at Masood. Gamma. Yeah. All right, we'll get to it. I was even listening to the YouTube thing. Practicing, practicing, practicing. Then they turn these lights on, cameras, and I freak out. All right. And of course, we see that Barnabas, his introduction to Paul is first welcomed into the Jewish Christian apostolic fear, sphere in Jerusalem. Barnabas was considered an apostle, not one of the original 12, but he was set apart with Paul by the Holy Spirit and sent out by the early church to spread the good news of Jesus Christ across the land. He was an itinerant missionary who had talk about Jesus, and walk in signs and wonders and miracles. In fact, in the book of Acts, um, the title of this missionary pair, we always see these various titles, and we see the apostles Barnabas and Paul. So let's look at this connection between Barnabas and Paul. We see that um, they knew each other 
like, and, and this is kind of interesting. How do these guys know each other? So Saul gets converted. He's trying to get into the church. He can't get into the church. And so what does he do? He goes to his, confer- his converted friend Barnabas because most likely these guys had studied together earlier in the school at... Can we, can we get... Get me out. Okay. Okay. And it's awesome. When we, when we post this online after the guys edit it, every time we get to that word, we'll insert the YouTube version of Gamiel, or however you say it. All right. It'll be good. It'll, it'll, okay. But while Barnabas was still the one um, uh, uh, with the primary introduction, we see that after Barnabas and Paul are working in Tarsus in Acts chapter 11, they're collaborating with all this energy. We see the foundation of Antioch. We see all these people coming to know the Lord. We see the expansion of the church. We see the Holy Spirit working through Barnabas and Paul to be set apart for the holy work of God. And then they go on this incredible missionary journey that leads them um, to uh, Seleucia, Cyprus, to Salamis, and then to Paphos. And then um, uh, we see that even when they come into uh, Lystra, and this is where the whole thing happens with, um, with the people being freaked out by these guys, calling them Hermes and Zeus. And this is in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 15. And this is a famous painting that accompanies the text. And I'm actually going to read this text out of the book of Acts. This is Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 15. To, uh, 8 to 15. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had a fixed gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and he began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in their own native language, the gods have become like men. They have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, and they wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So they're like, hallelujah, the Greek gods have become flesh. Bring out the animals. We're going to sacrifice these animals unto the gods. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their robes and they rushed into the crowds crying and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature, just like you, and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and all that is within them. Isn't that awesome? I'm telling you, it is so awesome to be accused of being a god. I've only had it happen one time. I've told you the story before, but I met a, 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 a real-life Tibetan Buddhist monk. A real-life Tibetan Buddhist monk on an airplane in India, and I was praying God, I want to meet a real monk and I want to lead him to Jesus. That's what I was praying. It was on my list. I made a list of things I wanted to see. Not only did Jesus give me a monk, he gave me a Tibetan monk. So cute with his shaved head and his orange and all this stuff. He's sitting next to me and we start a conversation. We hit it off and and, um, and we're talking about meditation. I'm like, do you meditate? He's like, well, of course. And, and I'm like, so do I. You're, you're a monk. Yeah. So am I. I was like, we got so many things in common. I was like, hey, when you meditate, have you ever seen Jesus? And he was like, no. And I was like, do you want to? 
I said, you can see him when you meditate. Anyways, so we're, we're, we're talking about things that you guys can't handle. And uh, anyways, um, w- when I get back to the U.S., there I have a Facebook request from him. And so, yeah, Tibetan monks have cell phones, okay? And they have Facebook. He, so we stay in touch. And then we lose touch. And we don't talk for many, many years. And then he reaches out to me one day. And he says, um, I'm no longer a monk. I had to quit my studies. I said, what's going on? He said, I had to, I had to move back to my home, which is um, in Bhutan, because um, I am unable to breathe. Uh, I, have a, a lung, I have a lung disease, and I can't breathe. And it's ruined my ability to be able to, to study. And then this way he said, any God that can heal me, I will serve him. Worship him. I forget the, the word choice. And so I said, are you available now? He said, yes. So we did a, a call. We did a live chat call. And so um, anyways, uh, I shared the gospel with him first. Went through it. I, I, I thought he had some sort of understanding of what I, of what I shared. Okay. And then here, I said, okay, here we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you. Okay. So I just want you to get comfortable. And you know what he does? He goes into like a, a lotus pose. He, you know, he crosses his legs. He goes into um, meditation mode. Okay. Which means he knows how to receive. Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was great. It's kind of like for us. It's like assume the position. <laughs> okay. That Buddhists have a position too. It's just a little bit different. So he goes into a position. And I tell you, I say, Jesus, we welcome the fire of, the God, the fire of God to come right now. And as soon as I say that, you can see the Holy Spirit come upon him. And, and I can see the Holy Spirit all over him. I said, hey, I want you to breathe. And I'm telling you, he breathed like I've never seen a human breathe before. He, it was the deepest breath I've ever seen. He, he goes, <sighs> and then he goes, I'm, he goes, I can breathe. And I was like, I can see that. He goes, I can breathe. And he's so excited. And then, and then this, is where, this is where it goes wrong. He goes, you are Zeus. No, he didn't call me Zeus. He says, you are my God, and I will serve you. I will worship you. I said, no, 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 no. Remember, I, we went through this. Bad monk. Remember, we went through this. I told you. I told you about Jesus. I told you about forgiveness. I told you about sin. And we went through all this. You weren't listening to a thing that I said, did you? Right? I, I, like, no, no, no. I am not God. I'm just, I, I, I yeah, yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, he goes, no, he, he goes, he goes, no, you are my God. You healed. I said, I did not. And all of a sudden, no connection. We lost connection. I'm calling him back. You know, trying to get through, trying to get through. Like, I, 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 this might have been what it was like for Paul and Barnabas. When they're like, they're, like, they're about to sacrifice cattle for us. Oh, no, 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 no. We are not going to take the glory for what Jesus just did. And it bothered them so much that they ripped their clothes. You know, this place of, like, we will shame ourselves because you are overly honoring us for something that we are not willing to do. So in a place of even shame and even exposure, we will not let, we will will not receive any praise from you. And it, it, it was good. I, I got a hold of my pastor friend in Bhutan, and I connected my pastor friend with him, and they were able to make contact. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But listen now, you are not Hermes, but it's a lot of fun to be accused of being Hermes. <laughs> and even Jesus said it like this, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. Isn't that cool? Yeah, isn't that cool? I give you permission for being accused of being a God. I give you permission to be accused of being a God. And when it happens, make sure that you point them to the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus the Christ. You know, it bums me out that it's been years since somebody threatened to worship me. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what bums me out. It's been too long. Come on. But then we see that at a certain period of time, Paul and Barnabas have a ding, ding, a bit of a disagreement. (laughs) And the the disagreement is around John Mark. And we see that um, the disagreement is whether or not they should include John Mark to be a part of their missionary 
uh, journey. We see this great quarreling. And, um, uh, 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 and what we see is Barnabas wants John Mark to be included. It, it was his cousin. And he's like, Paul, you don't understand. This is my cousin. This is John Mark. He's legit. I'm vouching for him. And Paul's like, no, I don't like him. There's something off. He looks at me weird. You know, and, and Barnabas is like, Paul, get over yourself. And Paul's like, I did get over my, like, stop. You know, and they're like, ah. And then they, they blocked each other on Instagram. <laughs> they unfriended each other on Facebook. And the great collaborative missionary partnership was over. As John Mark continued on his missionary journey with Barnabas. Now we do know uh, that in the letter to the Galatians, um, Paul spoke harshly about his friend and his brother in ministry, uh, stating, and if this was nowadays, Paul would have been on Facebook, noting that Barnabas is a hypocrite and he was led astray. This is a public, this is a public thing that he writes. He, he puts it on the message board to the Galatians. Barnabas is a hypocrite. He's led astray. But we do see that the quarrel was resolved uh, over time, we see in Colossians 4.10, it says, My fellow prisoner, um, uh, uh, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, saying to the Colossians that Mark and I are, were good, Barnabas and I are good. So when we look at Barnabas, we see a man who had respect, he had wealth, he uh, was a uh, uh, radically, religiously um, intelligent. We have a man that sold everything that he had, laying his possessions um, to the apostles in order to give to the poor. We see that uh, Barnabas literally followed the instruction of Jesus in Matthew 19, 21, where Jesus said to sell all your possessions um, and you will have treasures in heaven. Uh, Barnabas uh, followed this. That Barnabas was a mighty man of God. A good man. Known for being full of the Holy Spirit and faith. We see that in church records. That Barnabas, it was believed, was martyred. It is uh, stated that uh, due to his extraordinary success that fell upon him as he was disputing in the synagogue. They dragged him out of the synagogue. And after the most inhumane tortures, they stoned him to death. And it is also believed that John Mark was in the crowd and observed his cousin as he was being brutally uh, murdered. Now we're going to look at the very first deacon who would become the very first martyr in the New Testament church. We're going to look at the deacon Stephen. And he also had a reputation. He was known as the man that was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. He was the first of seven deacons in the Christian church. What's a deacon? Well, it's interesting. At this period of time, you had the apostles, okay? These guys walked with Jesus, loved Jesus, served Jesus. But these guys were also uh, out in the parking lot welcoming people, okay? They were also down in the kitchen um, doing dishes, okay? Um, they were also making graphics on Canva for the various conferences uh, that, they had, that they had coming up. That you had the apostles, and what were they doing? stinking everything. In fact, the apostles were so busy that they didn't even have time for the study of God's word and prayer. And all of a sudden they realized something. Hey, all these people are getting saved and there's a diversity of giftings and a diversity of offices and we need to recognize the giftings within the church and we need to empower people to be able to serve. So this is really big of the apostles. The apostles got a revelation. We don't have to do everything. The apostles got a revelation. We don't have to handle the budget as well as handle the strategic mission of the church. 
This is really big in the book of Acts. And eventually, the modern day church is going to, the modern day revival church is going to get a revelation that apostles don't have to do everything. So someone say amen. amen. Thank you. That this is why we have the glorious, beautiful, gifted body of Christ and that we need to have cultures where giftings can be identified within God's people. And that God's people don't just expect for the apostles to do everything. Now, what's so cool about the apostles is that they were not only willing, but they were doing everything. And that is the mark of a true apostle, is that you will see them doing things that they shouldn't be doing. But they're doing it because they have the heart of Jesus, which is the heart of a servant. And yet, at a certain period of time, there needs to be a culture within every apostolic center that holds apostles responsible to do what only they can do. Because when they get out of their lane, they are keeping other people from their position within the body of Christ. That when I get out of my lane, what does that mean? That means I could be in your lane. And where I think I am serving the body, I am actually causing accidents in the kingdom of God. You might be an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. You might be a deacon. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Know what God has called you to do. And if you've been in the pit stop for the last 20 years, getting your brakes replaced... Get on the road and pick a lane. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you. I love you. But so many people have been at the pit stop for the last 20 years. What are you doing? Getting my tires changed. Weren't you doing that five years ago? Yeah, but I got the newest tires. No, get on the road. Get back in the race. Find a tribe. Find a team and get involved. I'm glad that, I mean, that went over really well. Okay. That was really good. Awesome. All right. Just declare, I'm going to pick a lane. Just declare right now, my 2021 excuse. Go ahead, trust, trust me. I'm, I'm saying it too. My 2021 excuse is not going to work in 2022. God's doing a new thing, and I refuse to miss out on it. Just declare me right now, I refuse to miss out on what God is doing. There's a role for me in the body. There's something that I can do. And if I don't do it, some apostle's going to be doing it. And some city and nation's going to get robbed from because I've been in the pit stop. Now just keep repeating everything after me for the rest of the message. I'm just kidding. Here we go. He is the first deacon. He's uh, known as the proto-martyr, meaning the first martyr. We see with the life of Stephen that not a lot is known about his origin. But we see that he was a, uh, a Greek-speaking Jew. And his ministry was to the Hellenist Jews. So his ministry was also to the Greek-speaking Jews. And that he would minister to Jews who didn't necessarily subscribe yet to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he would use his service, he would use his gift of communication, he would use um, his anointing to serve Greek-speaking Jews and to lead them into an encounter with Holy Spirit. We do see that Saint, well, Saint Stephen, okay, um, this is a, uh, an, an, an iconic picture here of, of Stephen uh, holding a, 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 a church and holding the incense, the incense of worship associated um, with, his, with his martyrdom. And we see here that um, Stephen is brought to trial. And, um, and at trial, um, they are looking at him while they are asking him questions. And it acts chapter 6, verse 15, it says that members of the Sanhedrin, as they were looking at him, saw that his face began to transfigure into that of the face of an angel. It's interesting that as these men are sitting there in judgment, we have the high priest and what they do is they are accusing him of all these things, things that aren't even, even true. In fact, they are making up 
lies about him, such as, uh, one of the lies that they said is th- that they claim that they heard him speaking words of blasphemy against Moses, and they said that Stephen was speaking blasphemous words against God. Uh, they even say that they heard Stephen say that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy the temple and change all of the traditions that had been delivered by Moses. So here's the high priest, and there's all of this accusation. And what's interesting is that Jesus was given a, an opportunity to rebuttal. Jesus was given an opportunity to defend himself, and he didn't do it. Okay? So you would think that because Jesus didn't defend himself, that that would be, that would be the model. Okay? That Jesus did, didn't defend himself, so you shouldn't defend him. How many of you ever heard that before? Jesus didn't defend himself, so you shouldn't defend yourself. Well, then you should read the book of Acts. Because these guys defended themselves. And this is what the priests say. Stephen, we're going to give you a chance to defend yourself. When they said that, it says that he was immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen had already been filled with the Holy Spirit. Which is why we have the doctrine of, of not just one infilling. But we believe that every Christian should be ye filled with the Holy Ghost every single day. That you don't just eat from the tree of life once and you live forever, but you feast from the tree of life. You don't just drink of the cup once, but you receive your new wine daily. And what we see is that there are infillings that bring a fresh anointing so that there can be a heavenly and relevant response that in this case is going to be captured by Luke for generations to read. So they say, hey, you can defend yourself. So uh, this, is, this is so funny. I was just at the Spokane Healing Rooms this last weekend and, um, and had a great time with Cal Pierce and the incredible team there at the Spokane Healing Rooms. But the Lord gave me some interesting messages for them. Things that I hadn't preached on um, before. And, and uh, so the first night I preached, on the, Lord, the Lord was telling me that, that they need to own it. They need, they need to own what the Lord has given. They need to own their call. They need to own the anointing. And they need to own their commission. And to cast not away their confidence, which means boldness. Okay? It means authority. It also means publicity. Cast not away the publicity. Very, very interesting. But then last night, I spoke on um, how unchrist like Jesus was. And I preached a message where I went through the meanest things that Jesus says in his sermons. Jesus was so mean. And I went through all of these statements. He said the craziest stuff. And I was like, well, that's not very Christ-like. Well, that's not very Christ-like. The problem is, and we talked about this before, is that we interpret Christ-likeness through American lenses because we have an inaccurate definition for love. We have an inaccurate definition for peace. And we have an inaccurate definition of joy. We have American definitions for love, joy, and peace. And that's why the church is so weak. And that's why Christians look nothing like Christ. And that's why most preachers preach nothing like Jesus and nothing like Paul and nothing like Stephen. How does Stephen preach? This is a, this is a sermon. And one of, the, one of the greatest sermons in the book of Acts. And there's... There are just some famous sermons. And he begins by capturing the heart of his audience. Stephen begins by, he read Dale Carnegie's How to Make Friends and Influence People. He had read that book. He is going to, he's got, uh, Stephen did his Strength Finder, okay, 2.0. And on his Strength Finder, he had woo, win others over. So we're about to see how Stephen preaches this message and he Wins them all over. You ready? This is how he begins. You. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised in your hearts and ears. He just referred to their hearts and ears by a private part. 
Okay, that's offensive today. Can you imagine if I was like, you, your hearts look like your dongs. That's offensive now. And, and yet, and here he is with the religious. And that's what he says. He goes, <laughs> he goes, you always resist the Holy Ghost just like your father's. You guys, he not only insults them, he's like, not only are you completely missing it, you are missing it just like your ignorant daddies. They were just as ignorant as you. He says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? He says, and they have slain them who foretold of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers of, and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels, but you have not kept it. And it says that the members of the Sanhedrin, look at this, they were cut to the heart. And how did they respond? Not with repentance. It says, this is how Luke captures the response of the audience. They gnashed their teeth like dogs at him. <laughs> They gnashed their teeth like crocodiles. We're talking slobber, drool, and venomous rage. And we see that Stephen, in this place, boldly declares, as he is preaching, what begins to happen? As he is preaching, and as murderous rage is filling their hearts. God, in his mercy, opens heaven above him. And while he is still preaching, he looks up and he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they began crying out with one loud voice, they stopped their ears. They covered their ears. And they ran with one accord violently upon him. And they drug him outside the walls of Jerusalem. And there they stoned him until he was dead. But listen. As they're throwing rocks at him, they think that they are causing such harm upon him Little do they know, they are throwing rocks at his shell. Because Stephen never died. What do, we, what do we see here? That as he is still preaching, a portal opens and he looks up into the heavens. And there is Jesus, Messiah, with his arms stretched out towards him. Lifting him up into another realm as they take his earth suit outside the gates. And they begin to kill a body where the spirit is no longer in that body. Here's a, fam a famous painting of the martyrdom of Stephen. You see the angel coming down with the crown of martyrdom. And with an olive branch, also symbolic of martyrdom. We see Barnabas, an apostle, who was a sent one. And we see Stephen, who was not a sent one. We see Barnabas, his call was to go. And we see Stephen, and his call was to remain home and stay. We see Barnabas, whose reputation was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And we see Stephen, who is also full of the Holy Spirit and faith. We see Barnabas, who fulfilled his great call and was stoned to death. And we see Stephen, who was feeding Greek-speaking Jews while loving them and trying to lead them into a relationship with Messiah, many of which he would feed that had not yet even converted yet to the faith. He would minister to widows who had no income. He would, he, they, would, they would provide for them. That, that the church, that, that was, their, that was their, their role. There, there were no Roman government f 
food programs. There were no Roman food stamps. There was just, there was just your family. There was just the church. And, and, and here's Stephen, who is just this beautiful picture of a practical servant within the church who preaches one of the most anointed sermons, who had the honor of being one of the first to go because of his love and his public profession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that your prayer tonight? Isn't that your prayer is that we as a people, that we as a church, that our families, that our children would have a reputation of being full of the Holy Spirit and power. And that we, full of the Holy Spirit of power, would walk in such an anointing to articulate the beautiful, glorious, and offensive gospel of Jesus Christ. We see Barnabas who feared no man, but feared the Lord. We see Stephen who did not fear man, who did not fear death, but he feared the Lord. We see these apostles. We see these deacons. We see these characters that were radically changed. We see these shady, sketchy people with the craziest past who become wild evangelists that begin converting cities and eventually converting nations. And this is what I believe that the Lord is giving us permission to be. A generation of interrupters. A generation of disruptors. A generation that does not allow tradition to frame out our religion. But we allow intimacy and vibrancy, this place of passionate hunger for Christ Jesus and who He is, to so possess us that we fear no man. We don't fear the institution. We don't fear the wineskin. We don't fear the structure. We don't even fear spiritual mothers and fathers. We, we honor them, but we fear the Lord. And, and I believe in times like this, we need people who love Jesus and will speak the truth. In times like these, we need people who fear the Lord and will speak the truth. It is this place of, of not even necessarily weighing out the consequences, but saying that the consequences will be worth it. Because God is speaking. Is there anyone who is listening? And is there anybody who will communicate what the Father wants to say to a generation? God is speaking. Is anyone listening? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let's stand together tonight. Jesus, we want to be known for being a generation, a people, a church, a company that is occupied and possessed by the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Come and possess us. Come and possess us. Come and possess us. Come and possess our minds, our wills, our emotions. Come and possess our desires and our dreams. Come and possess our occupation and careers. Come and possess our thought and thought processes. Come and possess our responses and our reactions. Come and fill us with everything that you are. Come and fill us with true Christ-like love and joy and peace. And it's the kind of love that doesn't show up. It's the kind of that doesn't shut up. It's the kind of love that speaks up. It's the kind of joy that anchors our emotional stability so we can go through the hardest of brokenness and know that the joy of the Lord is our strength in that place of brokenness and in that place of of weeping. It's the kind of peace that that even the, the kind of peace that surpasses all understanding that when the math is not adding up, we know that we have peace. We know that our soul is fixed. Our soul is fortified. It is that place where we do not live our lives for the affirmation of man, but we live our lives in the proclamation and worship of Yahweh, Elohim, that we don't live for people. We live for God. You don't live for people. You live for God. You don't live for stuff. You live for heaven. You don't live for treasures that will rot and rust. You live 
for heaven. We store up our treasures in heaven. It says, and Barnabas was a wealthy man, a man with property, a, a man with money, and he, and he took it all, and he sold it all, and he brought it before the apostles, and he laid it down at their feet. He says, I'm trading in everything that the world counts as dear, and I'm trading it in because I know that God has called me, commissioned me, and anointed me for such a time as this. And the places where he's taking me, I will not be able to take these treasures with me. So instead, I will trade in these treasures for heavenly treasures. Oh God, we want to store up treasures in heaven, the kind of treasures that do not rust or decay. We thank you, Lord, for the call of God on each and every person in this room. And I pray, oh God, that you would dust off dusty hearts tonight and that you would soften hardened hearts tonight. And Lord, for those that have been in a place of hope deferred and discouragement, that you would come to them and that you would meet with them. Lord, I pray that we would not be stiff-necked. I pray that we would not be the ones with uncircumcised hearts and ears. I pray that we are not the ones that are being rebuked, but we are the ones doing the rebuking. We humble ourselves tonight. We humble ourselves tonight. We bow our hearts low before you, King Jesus. We say we know nothing but this. Christ Jesus and him crucified. Come occupy us. Come possess us. Come burn in us. Favorite movie? Not gonna lie. Braveheart. Favorite quote from the movie? Every man dies, but not every man really lives. I pray that every man, every woman in this room would fully live, would fully live in Christ. That Jesus said, I have come not that you'd have belief or theology or religion, but I have come that you would have life. And I pray that every person in this room would discover eternal life, lasting life, and the kind of life that can only be found through Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus tonight, tonight is the perfect night to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you invite him into your life, if you invite him into your heart, if you invite him into your dreams, if you invite him even into your sinfulness, he will come inside of you and he will transform you and he will change you and he will awaken you to who you really are and what he's called you to do in this hour. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You guys want to worship for a second? I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling that. You guys kind of feeling that? Can we just respond just by worshiping Jesus for a minute or two? Awesome. Thanks, Josh. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new crown so i yield so i yield to you into your careful hand when i trust you i don't need to understand make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine out of me yes Jesus bring new wine out of me new freedom and the kingdom is here I lay down my old flames to carry your new fire to take cause where there is new wine there is new Carry your new fire. 
me a vessel. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing. But all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Yes, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Yes, Jesus, bring new wine. Jesus, Jesus, bring new wine. Jesus, bring new wine. here tonight and you just say Pastor Darren I got tricked I got lied to I've lost my momentum in the kingdom and I don't know when it happened if it was during COVID or before or after I don't know but I've lost my momentum and I don't feel like I have the energy to get back up to speed and I've been thinking about quitting. I've been thinking about giving up. But I just, I don't feel like I've, I've got what it takes to get, to get going like the way that I was, that I was going. And you're just, you, you, you feel lost in this season. If, if, if that's you, would you just wave at me? Awesome, awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Because uh, I actually, I actually want to, if it's all right, I'd love to actually invite you uh, to the front here. I want to release a prayer, and then I want to release our ministry team. Because the Lord's going to, He's going to remove that feeling off you. Because the truth is, you're not actually lost. You're very found. And you, and you got lied to. And I believe that tonight, this is going to be really easy. It's really simple. It's just by faith. But the Lord's going to um, recommission people tonight. He's going to reappoint people tonight. He's going to reanoint people tonight. And you're not going to have to go back to where you were. You're not going to have to, to, to try real hard to get back up to speed. Because he's just going to pick you right up in his, in his daddy hand. And he's just going to put you right back, right back on the road. And you're not going to have to make up for lost time. He's just going to place you right back down, right, right in your lane. And you're just going get, to get back in the race tonight. Uh, so I'd like to just invite you just to come real quickly and, and I'm just going to just release a quick prayer and then, um, I, and then I'm going to have our, our, team, our team pray and again um, hey awesome yeah God bless you God bless you yeah 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 and um, yeah and, and move real quick move real quick you're, you're just you're, you're feeling lost you don't feel like you're in your lane and um, I know there's I know there's more than three <laughs> but I love the three these guys are going to get radically set free tonight. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But I know there's more. I know there's more. I know there's more. Be bold. Be bold. Be very courageous. Awesome, 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 awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you, buddy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 It's all right. The enemy lies to everybody. Yeah, the enemy lies to everybody, and he lies because when, when we accidentally kind of just believe, we believe the feelings, before we know it, we lost our wheels, we lost our legs, we lost our wings. And tonight you're going to get your wheels back. Tonight you're going to get your wings back. Tonight you're going to get your legs back. Enough metaphors already. <laughs> Would you guys just stretch out your hands? Listen, there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. There's people in this room, and there's a, there's a call of God on your life. And, and you know that the Lord is calling for you to get out of the boat. And you're just like, it's too much work. I just, don't, I just don't have what it takes anymore. Awesome. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Okay. Everybody, uh, everybody up here. I'm going to have you just, just make a declaration with, with me right now. 
and don't fight it, don't resist it, okay? Just declare something right now. I am called. I am anointed. I am commissioned by my Father. And if He's for me, who can stand against me? This is going to be the most difficult part. Are you ready? Declare me right now. I am called to lead. And I will no longer resist that call. Hallelujah. 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 Our ministry team can come too. I'm just going to anoint them with oil, but hallelujah. 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 I am called to lead. You guys can have oil too. I am called to lead. I am called. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed. Yep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am called. I'm commissioned. I'm anointed. I'm called to lead. Hallelujah. 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 I am called. I'm commissioned. I'm anointed. I will lead. I am called. I'm commissioned. I'm anointed to lead. Hallelujah. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed to lead. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed to lead. My heart is an open space I am called for you to come and have I am your way. I am open. I am anointed to I lead. am open. I am called. My heart is an open space for you to come. I am commissioned. Have your way. I am open. I am anointed. I am open. to lead. I am called. My heart is an open space for you I am commissioned. to come and have your way. I am, I am anointed. Open. I am open. To lead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My heart is an open there's, space there's, 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 for you hallelujah. to come and have your way. I am open. I am called. I am open. I am commissioned. I am anointed to lead. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed. I have permission to lead. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed to lead. I am called. I am commissioned. I am anointed to lead. You make me come alive. You make me come alive. I am called. You make I am commissioned. You make I am anointed. To lead. You make me come alive. You make us come alive. 
I am calm. I am commissioned.